Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Holman. I'm the Senior Manager of Clinical Affairs at Ecolab, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. Our speaker today is Elaine Black. Elaine and I have worked together for several years, and I find her extremely knowledgeable and also very good at uh, explaining things in a way that everyone can understand. And she's so knowledgeable about disinfectants that I'm really happy to be talking to her today and, and talking about disinfectants. Elaine is a key liaison for Ecolab with the EPA and the FDA for matters that pertain to Ecolab registered antimicrobial product portfolio. She holds leadership positions on antimicrobial industry trade associations, including the Center for Biocide Chemistry and the Household and Commercial Products Association. Elaine received her Bachelor in Food Science and a PhD in Microbiology, both from University College Cork, Ireland. Prior to joining Ecolab, she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Delaware and the University of Minnesota. She has held positions at Ecolab as a product development microbiologist and a technical service lead. Elaine is a published author of 15 peer-reviewed articles and two book chapters in areas of microbiology, food safety, and disinfection. Today's webinar will be a Q&A session with Elaine to answer frequently asked questions related to disinfectant products and technology. So welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Linda. Here's our agenda. Yeah. So what we're going to cover today is EPA registered antimicrobials, including different antimicrobial product types. We'll talk about EPA's list in for COVID-19, and we'll talk about claims and label instructions. And then we'll go over application methods, such as in fogging, spraying, and wipes. We'll talk about antimicrobial devices. We'll talk about unusual disinfectant practices, and then we'll have conclusions, and then we'll answer some questions from the audience. So today's topic is EPA registered antimicrobial products for the healthcare environment. And the first topic we'll talk about is these products. So the first question for you, Elaine, is what is the difference between a sanitizer, a disinfectant, and a sterilant? And are they required to be registered? All right, thank you, Linda. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I think you were very kind and started off with a softball question. So um, I'll get into the details of sanitizer, disinfectants, and sterilants. So I'm gonna talk about these in order of potency. Um, so if we start off with sanitizers, um, Excuse me, and then we're, I'm going to use the EPA definitions or a, a kind of a watered down version of the EPA definitions for these types of products. So, sanitizers um, reduce the bacterial population on the surface by significant numbers. So, when we think about sanitizers, I think a good way to think about these products are the ones that we see, you know, for use in kitchens or um, for, for use in your home um, on surfaces like food contact surfaces or indeed in the food industry where, um, where, you, where you need uh, a slightly um, less robust chemistry. Um, and then when you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you move on to disinfectants, you're talking about a stronger type of chemistry that destroys or irreversibly inactivates bacteria, fungi, and viruses, but not necessarily bacterial spores. So disinfectants are used um, you know, throughout a lot of environments. You, know, you have them in your homes for your bathrooms and types of um, other other types of um, surfaces, but then you see them a lot in the healthcare industry for that that higher level of in, of um, disinfection or higher level of kill. And although you don't have to have a spore kill on a disinfectant in the healthcare industry, obviously we have C diff issues, so it's very common to see disinfectants um, in the healthcare industry with C diff um, claims. As we move up in potency, we get to sterilants. And these destroy or eliminate all forms of microbial life. So these, these are the big guns, um, including um, all forms of vegetative bacteria, bacterial spores, fungi, fungal spores, and viruses. And when we, when we think about the products that are associated with the sterilant class, we think about things um, like um, sterilizing uh, medical equipment and um, devices, but also we use sterilants in sterilizing packages and food processing too. And we'll talk a little bit about some other uses for sterilants um, later on in the in the deck. As for regulatory requirements, yes, these products need to be registered. We need to be able to give um, our customers and the public a sense of um, of confidence in these products, so they're registered through the US EPA. So the products must be must go through um, a federal registration with the US EPA. 
but they're also registered in every state that they're sold. And those, those um, state registrations must be renewed every year to keep selling those products. So in terms of requirements, um, there is a lot of data that goes into um, developing a product. And so the safety, so the toxicology, environmental safety, and human safety must be taken into consideration and data is generated. Um, the chemistry and stability of that product, shelf life, that type of thing. And then also a really robust package of efficacy data. So that would be microbiological testing of any organism that is on the label. So there's data to back up those claims. Um, and then a master label is, um, with all the claims, is reviewed by the EPA. So that's, that's anything we're going to say about the, about the product. All of that is reviewed, submitted and reviewed by the EPA. And a note on claims and marketing. So, you know, everything that goes into that product um, is, is, you know, backed up by data. And a company needs to very strictly adhere to the EPA-approved language on that master label of anything concerning that product. Okay, so I think that's a nice graphic that, that we put in. Yeah, and this was a nice graphic that we put in, which really just reiterates what you already just said, but <clears throat> kind of outlines what the basic difference is between a sanitizer and a disinfectant. I don't know if you want to say anything else about this, yeah, but if you think maybe you know, we already are, covered it. These are the two most common ones that we see, you know, in our, you know, in our daily use of sanitizer and disinfectant. So this is kind of just a nice, easy look to see what you're expecting to see. You're expecting to see more bacterial claims on the sanitizer. You know, a couple do have viral claims, but it's, it's rare. And then on a disinfectant, you're seeing um, that the range of organisms is much wider. So, you know, including fungi, viruses, and bacteria. Great. Okay. So the next question is, this is a new virus. So how can a company claim that a product can be used effectively during COVID-19 pand pandemic? And where can I find the best information about which products to use against COVID-19? All right, so yeah, it's a new virus. So you can imagine that there are lots of challenges of getting the strain into a lab, getting methods up and running, um, and, and eventually getting a claim against that specific virus on the label. And, um, you know, there is a lot of, of this, as I stated before, a lot of data and, um, and uh, there's a lot of process to get a product approved by the EPA. It takes, it, it can be a multi-year process, process going from start to finish of developing a product to launching it. And then if you add anything new to a, a label, like a new virus or a new claim, then that also needs to go through a regulatory process to make sure that that data is reviewed too. So that can be multi, that can be many months to get that kind of, um, you know, new ad or new label claim added to the label. So for this reason, you can imagine with SARS-CoV-2, um, we, you know, we're learning more and more about this virus and we're not quite there yet to have actual claims on our label. Um, and obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, nobody would, would have even thought about putting this on their label. Um, there are a lot of uh, work streams right now in the industry of, you know, getting labs up and running. And I think in the next, you know, probably four to six months, we'll see some label claims appear on the market for this specific virus. But, you know, the EPA is prepared for this. Um, and they actually took a really nice step after the Ebola, um, after the Ebola outbreaks uh, to make sure that, companies and, and the public could be prepared and have some sense of um, confidence that the products that we have out there are capable of killing some of these new viruses or new emerging viruses. And so what they did was they have, they, um, they put forth uh, the emerging viral pathogen guidance in 2016, and this allowed companies to get pre-approved with a label claim called an emerging viral pathogen claim. So it means that there's, there's a, a bulk of products that are pre-approved, um, and they can make statements about the effectiveness of against SARS-CoV-2. So this guidance was triggered by the EPA in, I think it was um, just a few months ago, when you know the pandemic was starting to show up. Um, and there were at least 50 products out there on the market that had these claims. And the approval is based on the product's ability to kill, um, I'm just gonna mute my, um, my computer. So the, the approval is based on the fact that the products were already proven to kill um, a harder to kill virus. So, you know, this is an envelope virus. So if you have some non-envelope viruses on your label and the EPA has looked at that and it proved it, 
um, such as neuro polio, polio and rhinovirus, then you can make these statements, these pre-approved statements. So um, when we when we started with the pandemic, we have these 50 products. Um, that you know, as as it started to, and the EPA actually pulled those products together in what is known as List N, and List N is um, a list on the EPA's website that has disinfectants for use against SARS-CoV-2. This is really helpful and very useful, but it quickly became clear that there was shortages of products. I mean, we all saw the empty shelves as we as we um, started to um, go on lockdowns and and work from homes. So it led to a change in policy from the EPA, and they looked at the science, and they decided to also allow products that have the human coronavirus claim. So this is a virus that is very similar to the SARS-CoV in structure. Um, these kinds of products were added to the list. Later on, they made additional changes. So sterilants were added to the list. As you saw in the definition, they can kill viruses. Um, products with norovirus claims were added to the list, and products that had already been approved for the Ebola virus were added to the list. So now the list actually has 400 products. Um, you know, the list is a collection of primary registrations. So those 400 products are primary base registrations, and there are you know many more products that have been sub-registered from those. So it means that the trade or the commercial name may not be on the list, um, and actually the registration number is the most important thing that you can look for on the list. And we actually have a little slide next to show. Um, show how to look up that number. So, so first of all, it's very easy to look for List N on the internet. If you just go to Google and type in List N for COVID or List N EPA, you can find it. Um, if you go to your product that you have or that you're thinking of buying, you go to the label and you look for the EPA registration number. So we have it just circled here in red. So that will be either a, a, um, a number that has two sets of digits or three sets of digits. The first set of digits here in yellow is the base register at company number, and then the second set is the product number, and these are the two most important numbers. Um, you go to the EPA's website and find List N, and they have a little search bar, so you can type in the number. And, and if a product comes up, no matter what the name is, because the name may be changed, um, you know, the, the trade name may be different from the original name that was registered, um, if it shows up, then you are confident that, that this product um, has been approved or has been um, put on this end for use against SARS-CoV. There's also, if you, if you look at that little graphic, there's a little blue box that says other search options. You can click in there and you can get more information about the product. So you can get um, information about the, um, the application type, which they call actually the formulation type. Um, so that would be you know, whether it can be, it's a ready to use product or it's a dilutable product or a white product. So you can type in some of those search, um, search words and it, it'll pull up all the products that are white, for example. Um, there's also a little button where you can convert that to a PDF and that will pull up a list for you um, and actually give you all the columns and all the information that they have captured. Something new that they added just yesterday um, were additional applications and also they added whether or not you need to rinse the surface afterwards, and we can actually talk about that a little bit later. So lots of really good information on the scent. That's great, and this, looking at the example in the box on the right, you can see under product name that there's one example of a product that has sort of a code name, the SCAHD64, and then the one below it has more of a, a brand name. So that's an example of the way the products might be listed on list M. But it's good to know that, that um, the EPA has uh, really done a good job of trying to provide the information that we need to, to find the products we can use for COVID-19. So the next question then is, what is the difference between the master label and the commercial label? Absolutely. Um, you know, we mentioned the master label in, you know, one of the first slides. It's, it's the label that goes in for review with the EPA. Um, and basically the master label contains everything that appears on the commercial label and more. So the commercial label, is that label you will see that you're familiar with. You'll see it on the bottle um, or on, you know, the, the five gallon pail or whatever it is that the product comes to you in. Um, and so, so that's, that's the label that gives you the use instructions and the information that you need for, for daily use of the product. The master label has a lot of additional information. Um, it has additional use sites or applications 
um, for versions of the product that are available in different formats or markets. And as you saw, you know, we could have a, a, um, a product, a base registration that is um, sold in different markets, so there may be different trade names. Um, and so, you know, one might be sold to, you know, veterinary offices, so it, have the, it would have the veterinary uses on the commercial label that are also on the master label. Um, so it also has marketing language for um, brochures or websites any communications related to the product. So those, those, um, that approved language is that, that language that you put on the master label has been approved by EPA and that's the language that we use to communicate about our products. And then the emerging viral pathogen is on the claim. So this is the most important for today's, um, today's topic. So I think when the, the, when the, when the emerging viral pathogen guidance was developed by the EPA, they really um, were thinking about trying not to confuse, you know, the, um, the end user with the, the emerging viral pathogen claim. This is kind of, there's some real reg speak, regulatory speak on this claim. Um, and there are different classes of viruses, so there's different ways to trigger the claim. Um, so it originally went on the, the master label. As we've gone through this process of a, of a pandemic and trying to get information out to the public, we've seen the challenges, because this is the very first time it's been triggered, and we've seen the challenges, and EPA has also seen the challenges. So we will likely see some changes to, the, to how the emerging viral pathogen is communicated in the future. And I think we're all learning a lot from this, um, this pandemic. I put a little asterisk here for the additional use sites and applications. So the additional applications that are on a master label, you know, may not have viricidal claims associated with them. And what I mean by that is that if you look at a master label and you're used to, you know, spraying this product with a trigger spray and that's how you um, disinfect your surface for viruses. The, the label may also have a fogging claim on there, um, but it's it's unlikely that that fogging claim is um, it, well. I shouldn't say unlikely, but it, that fogging claim may not be um, linked to the viral claim. So the the application and the organism that you're killing have to be linked in order to use it to kill the virus. So um, EPA has done a nice job of actually also putting this on list N. So if you're looking for a product to fog or mist, you can actually type that into the search function and find it because just because it's on the master label does not mean it's suitable for COVID-19. So the master label is a really important thing to be aware of because that's really the place where all the information about disinfectants is, can be found uh, on the EPA website. Absolutely. So, the next question then is, how do I know what concentration and contact time to use for a product on EPA list N? And do surfaces need to stay visibly wet for the entire contact time? So um, when we're talking about uh, ready to use products, the concentration is pretty easy because it's already made at the concentration that you need. But for dilutable products, really need to go into the disinfection section on your label, so commercial or master, um, and, and follow those label instructions carefully to make up that use solution um, that's going to be effective against the virus. Uh, the contact time or the dwell time is the, is the time it takes for a product to work or to kill the target virus. And these times have, are actually times that have been tested in the lab under standard conditions. So, you know, we have standard methods um, and, and everything that is on a label, any, any um, pathogen claim that is on a label has been tested in the lab using those contact times. So, you know, the best way to make sure that you're kind of mimicking the efficacy we got in the original test method and the original data is to, um, is to thoroughly wet the surface and to reapply the product if necessary. So do stick to your contact times and the EPA does regard contact time as wet contact time. Um, and we know that, you know, in the lab, we cannot mimic all of the environmental conditions that, you know, that you all as end users are experiencing. Um, so, you know, so the best, the best practice is to stay wet. Um, and then when we think about contact times for SARS-CoV, they're actually displayed on, on, EPA, on EPA's list N. So when you first pull up that list, there'll actually be a contact time associated with the product. So this is very, it's very handy. It's been picked out of the label by the EPA to help us. Um, how they've come up with the contact time, because as you know, some of the labels are complicated and they have various contact times. 
So if the product has the emerging viral pathogen claim, the EPA has defaulted to the contact time for the hardest to kill virus or the harder to kill virus. And then for products that were added later, the ones with human coronavirus, um, you know, their eligibility to be on the list is due to their human coronavirus claim, then you actually can go straight to that human coronavirus contact time, and that's the contact time that you should use. But really, if there's any discrepancies that you spot or there's any concerns about the contact time, then you should just um, either go back to the master label and, and try to figure it out, but the quickest really way is really to go to your chemical provider um, and, uh, and talk about your concerns, and they can walk you through the label. That's great. Okay, good information. So we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about food contact surfaces. Um, because in this COVID-19, sometimes we're getting engaged in having to clean and disinfect areas for COVID-19 that we maybe hadn't thought about before in our hospitals and healthcare institutions. And so let's just talk a little bit about how do I tackle food contact surfaces and is it okay to use disinfectants on food contact surfaces? Okay, and this is a topic that's, that's been coming up a lot, um, you know, as, as we go through this, this pandemic. So in general, when you're talking about your food prep area or your kitchen in your hospital, um, you know, you really need to be following the local food code for sanitizing um, these food prep areas. So, you know, the types of products that we're using on food contact surfaces are food contact sanitizers. And these have been um, formulated and, and created using ingredients that are uh, been designated as being safe to use in a food contact sanitizer. And they're also in the product at levels that are um, known as tolerance, le tolerance limits or tolerance levels. So it means that they're at a level in the product, in the sanitizer, um, that are safe for food. So that, you know, when it eventually is on the surface or if it's transferred to the food, it's not gonna have any ill effects on the human being. Um, so that's, that's an important note about how food contact sanitizers are, are developed and, and there's a lot of um, like background data on that goes into generating those. Disinfectants on the other hand, um, you know, depending on the disinfectant, but they, they, they may not have been created um, using those tolerance limits or our, um, they may have other ingredients that are not on those, um, on those food safe lists. Um, and so when we're talking about cleaning and disinfecting, you know, hard surfaces that, you know, are going to have food put on them later, um, we really may need to make sure that there's an extra step involved to make sure that we remove any disinfectant residues that may be left after disinfecting. So, you know, when would you use a disinfectant as opposed to a food contact sanitizer? So in the times of COVID, um, you know, we may have incidents where either we're on a regular schedule to deep clean our kitchen or we've increased the frequency to do a deep clean. And obviously we're going to do the high touch non-food contact areas in the kitchen, but we're also going to want to disinfect the food prep areas. And of course, if there's, um, you know, a case or a suspected case, like, um, one of our staff members is, um, has come down with, the, with COVID or, um, or there's some symptoms or suspected um, cases in the kitchen, then we want to, you know, clean all those areas with a disinfectant because we've got the claims, um, the, the necessary claims for that. Um, so the process really is pretty easy. Um, we want to pre, you know, pre-clean any visit areas, um, disinfect, you know, be mindful of the contact time, dry or wipe the surfaces afterwards. And then the additional step is to rinse with a potable water rinse to remove any residues that might get into the food and then re, um, re-sanitize that, that surface um, with a food contact sanitizer before any food is put on that surface. So it's extra steps, but it's to keep us all safe. That's great. Okay, thank you. So now we're gonna move on to something different. We're gonna talk about application methods for disinfectants, vapor, fogging, misting, spraying, and making your own wipes. So we get lots of questions about this, and so we thought we would just um, explain a little bit more about that. So the first question is, what's the difference between vapor, fogging, misting, and spraying a disinfectant? This is uh, absolutely a hot topic, um, and there is a lot of very, very confusing information out there. So, you know, there's a, a high interest as we think about 
not only, you know, reopening facilities, but also in, you know, setting up sealed hospitals and various other things that are going on right now in our, in our new, new normal. There's a high interest in fast and efficient delivery of disinfectants um, for medium to large areas. And so, you know, the, the, the go-to or the, 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 um, the disinfectant application du jour that we're hearing about is, are these misting and fogging applications. We have to remember that not all of these are suitable for healthcare uses because there's a lot of considerations we need to think about. So uh, what I've tried to do here is to put together um, how these products are kind of being presented to us on the market. Um, so these are not you know, technical definitions by any means, but this is kind of what we're seeing on the market today. So you know, we have our traditional spray uses. So those are the things we're very familiar with, the trigger and core spray, pump up or pressurized sprays. Then we have um, the ones that are in the news a lot, and that are, those are the specialized spray uses that are electrostatic. So the difference for these, and you know, there's a little picture of the kind of, um, I, I heard one of my colleagues call it the squirt gun, um, the, the, the squirt gun electrostat electrostatic sprayers. Um, these have a nozzle, a specialized nozzle, that charges the droplets to increase the coverage um, and, and to, you know, to do large areas of, of disinfection. Um, and then next we have fogging and misting applications. So, you know, the primary applications that we're seeing or that, you know, that really are available are automated fogging machines where um, a unit that's probably attached to a, a tank of disinfectant is, you know, wheeled into an enclosed space. The, the space is, is sealed, so vents are sealed, doors and windows are sealed. Um, and then the person who's, you know, operating it it leaves the room and operates it remotely. So the fog is, um, you know, the liquid is, is um, moved up in a fog into the air, fills the room. Eventually, it kind of settles on all of the surfaces in order to disinfect those surfaces. And then the other fogging and missing application we're seeing are the handheld foggers. So again, it's, it's kind of a mist or a fog that's going, is, you know, it being emitted from this, you know, more port portable version of this first one. It's operated by an applicator that is wearing pretty strict um, PPE because these mists or fogs, as you can imagine, you know, um, you know, there's concerns about them getting into people's lungs. So, you know, you know, both of these fogging and misting applications are, you know, should be applied in a space where there's, you know, no other humans present, with the exception of the applicator who's all kitted up. And then, you know, vapor is not not very different from the fogging and misting, but what we're seeing is it's just being kind of marketed differently. And what we're seeing is a lot of um, hydrogen peroxide vapor, um, offer, not a lot, but some offerings on the market. And these are specialized vapor generating units that are, you know, used in a similar way to the fogging and misting. They're wheeled into a room, the space is sealed off, and they're operated remotely. I think the difference here, and the difference at least that I've seen, is that the fogging and misting are generally um, more kind of a wet application, and the vapor ones are a little bit more of a like less moisture in the air um, or higher concentrations of the um, of the active ingredient. So we're just getting less wetting, but there actually there's a, a delivery of more chemistry to the surface to get the kill. Elaine, is so there important? Some, oh, go ahead. Oh, my qu my question was going to be: Is it fair to say that these are listed sort of in order of particle size that they emit? Is that a, like traditional you know, spray is a, a coarser particle or is that not necessarily the case? I would say a traditional spray is, is coarser, specialized is, the specialized sprays we're seeing, yeah, less, less coarse particles. And then the fogging and misting, I don't really have to, you know, I, I can't really rank those um, mm -hmm. because I think it really depends on the equipment. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, I think in general, yeah, the traditional sprays would be the most coarse. Um, okay. So that's the, Thank you. the largest droplets. Sorry, threw um, you a curveball there. No, that's, that's quite okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, yeah, the, the technical definitions, I think for me, they're, they're a little more, they're a little harder. Um, yeah. The, the fogging vapor generation and electrostatic spray applications or uses, when we think about these, they're actually, they're required to have specific label claims you know, on the master label, on the commercial label, if you're going to use these with, with the, um, if, you're going to, if you're going to use the chemistry with these applications. Um, and these applications on the label also must be linked to the viricidal claims that, 
you know, that we are, that are important for COVID-19. So kind of like I alluded to earlier, just because there's a fogging claim on the label does not mean that it's actually suitable for COVID-19 because it may be a fogging claim for um, deodorizing, um, which is actually quite a common fogging claim. Um, okay. Great. All right, so sort of related to that last statement there, how do I find a legitimate large surface disinfectant, disinfection product or service that can be used against the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Yeah, I think this is important because I think there's a lot of services being offered currently. And I think it's, it's important for, for folks to have a list of, of questions in their head that they can ask to weed out the good from the bad. So, um, like I said earlier, specialized applications like fogging and vapor generation, you know, they're, for the products that are used in these applications are required to have specific label claims. Um, so they, and those claims must be linked to, to the viral claim. So they must have some sort of data or science to back up that they can actually do this for COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it, and the easiest way really to, to look this up is to go to LISTEN because EPA have done a nice job of pulling out those fogging claims or electrostatic spray claims, and they've put those on this end. Um, unfortunately, very few of these applications are, list, are on this end today, but I think we're just, we're seeing a, a high interest in the EPA. Um, EPA are showing a high interest in, um, you know, looking at data and making sure that there are um, applications available to people um, and making sure that, that they are legitimate claims. So. EPA is working on this, and I know many uh, companies are working on this too. So currently we're seeing disinfectants or sterilants that are suitable for hard non-porous surfaces on the sen that, um, that can be fogged. Um, and we're seeing sterilants actually for, for porous and non-porous. So the porous would be your soft surfaces or your divider curtains or um, other soft surfaces in the room. The, especially those vapors will penetrate um, those surfaces. And so, um, the EPA has, has, you know, kind of given the, the okay for those to be used for soft surfaces um, as part of a fogging um, protocol. So when you're thinking about uh, somebody's coming to you with a service, I think the things that you should be asking or looking out for, the first one I have not it written down here, but um, is to make sure that they are, can, you know, have a, a sense of how much product to put in the room to get all the surfaces. So some sort of, um, a realistic calculation um, of how much um, product is needed to fog a room and to and to um, meet the needs of the surfaces and the and the room that you're fogging. So um, they also need to you know show you and have procedures for sealing the room effectively so that there's no escape of that fog that that may interfere with your patients or or your staff. Um, they may they must have safe re-entry procedures. Um, and they must have all the necessary PPE and equipment um, for handheld foggers and for um, even the ones that roll into a room because if you need to re-enter that room if something malfunctioned, you need to be wearing the correct PPE. So PPE, you know, um, all of the NIOSH respirators or things that they need to have, um, you know, that's, that's a very important part of this. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, again, it's good to note that no person's Staff patients should be present during fogging, misting, or vapor applications, other than the trained handheld equipment operator who is obviously wearing the PPE. I'm, I'm kind of hammering home the PPE here, but it is it is important. Yeah, very good. Safety is super important. So we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about make your own wipes. So how do I know a product can be used in a make your own wipe system? Okay, and we should probably, I guess define a little what a make your own wipe is versus um, a pre-saturated wipe. So a pre-saturated wipe are the ones that you, you know, can buy off the shelf or, you know, the ones that, you know, the canister is already full of, of wipes and those are saturated or soaked and you pull it out and go. Um, and a make your own wipe is more of a do-it-yourself um, situation uh, where, you know, you, 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 um, you put it together yourself. Um, so the pre-saturated wipe system, so the, the ones you can buy off the shelf, um, those are actually tested, uh, so the, the, the regulated method or the, the method that we use to, to, um, to verify the efficacy of those, it goes through um, a method that involves both 
removal and kill um, using that wipe. The um, make your own wipe system is really, the, the wipe in that system is really just um, a stand-in for a cloth or a mop or a scrubber, or, you know, something else that we would use to deliver the chemistry to the surface. So that, that removal aspect is, is not taken into account. So um, you think about it just as a stand-in for a cloth. And so, if, but if you want, really want to, if you want to use this and be it for it to be legitimate, you really need to see disposable wipes on the label as a vehicle for getting the product to the surface. So you can see here on the, if you go to the disinfection section in the direction for use, it says apply the solution with mop, cloth, sponge, brush, scrubber, disposable wipe, or coarse spray. So, um, so this is a suitable product for a make your own wipe system. Okay, Great. You want to go to the next? Yep. Yep. So the next question is, what are the recommended instructions for use or directions for a make your own wipe system? Sure. Um, pretty simple, hopefully kind of self-explanatory. Um, you know, make sure that the size of the, the roll fits the bucket or fits the canister. Um, you don't want to have the small roll in the large canister because you're not going to get the right saturation. So, um, apply the roll or put the roll into the canister um, and then you pour the recommended amounts of chemistry at the right concentration. So if it's, um, if it's an RTU, you know, you pour it in, but if it's not, it's, it's, you dilute it to the right use concentration or um, use solution, then you pour it in over the wipes. Pour it in a circular pattern so you get that full coverage and then you allow the wipes to soak for five minutes before use. Pull the wipe through the lid, place the lid on the canister, and pull the first wipe through. And there you kind of do the touch test. So the wipe should feel damp, but not dripping. Um, and then you can use it as you would um, any other wipe or any other cloth um, to get the, the product to the surface. Okay, great. So we're going to change gears a little bit again, and we're going to talk about antimicrobial devices. And I know you're going to define what that is for us, but the first question sort of explains what that is. So can ozone generators, UV lights, or air purifiers be used to kill SARS-CoV-2? Okay, so yes, I've, we titled it antimicrobial devices because sometimes it's a little bit confusing. The EPA defines these actually as, or calls these pesticidal devices. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, the definition for a pest in the EPA world includes bacteria and viruses. So, uh, so these instruments or, or devices are called pesticidal devices. So they're any instrument or other machine that's used to destroy, repel, trap, or mitigate a pest, including bacteria and viruses. And so these are the non-chemical approaches to disinfection um, or to in disinfection um, or to, to killing the bacteria or the viruses. So list N, it's important to note that list N does not include any devices. So the EPA has not approved any device currently for use against SARS-CoV. So they, and the reason, and they, this, my, my answer is actually taken pretty much directly from the EPA's answer to this question on their frequently asked questions um, webpage. So unlike chemical pesticides, US EPA does not routinely review the safety or efficacy of pesticidal devices. And therefore, they cannot confirm effectiveness against the spread of COVID-19. This is important to note if, you're, if your device manufacturer is, is, is claiming some of this. Um, it's important to kind of dig a little deeper with them about what data they have to back up their claims. There are no standard methods for devices. Um, it's unlikely, I mean, it, they, may, they may have started testing against SARS-CoV-2, but it's unlikely that they actually have data for SARS-CoV-2 just yet. Um, there's no standard methods for devices, and we can't really compare efficacy across devices. And right now, we can't really compare efficacy of a device to a chemistry either, because the chemistry has got a lot of standard methods in place, and we can compare products with each other, but we can't compare devices with each other. Um, and devices have limitations. Some devices have limitation in how they're used, how often they're used. Um, and you know, very often we can they can only be used as an as an adjunct to routine disinfection or cleaning and sanitation practices. And very often, you know, you have to go through all of your other practices, or you should go through all your other practices, and you use these as an add-on afterwards. Um, device providers 
should obviously have data or clinical studies to back up their claims. And this is where you know you as as you as you look for something that's suitable for your facility, um, you need to be very cognizant of those of the, that data and, and understand those claims, and understand what they're selling to you. Um, selling pesticides. Selling pesticidal devices with false or misleading claims without about safety or efficacy may subject the seller to legal penalties. So, you know, just like our chemicals and our, our disinfectants, um, we are subject to this too. We cannot make false or misleading claims about our products. Um, these device manufacturers should not be making false or misleading claims either about what they can and can't do with these devices. Very good. Okay, so we've talked about disinfectants and application methods, and we've talked about uh, antimicrobial devices. And so now uh, the next question is, what are some of the most worrisome disinfectant uses that you've been hearing about due to COVID-19? Unfortunately, Linda, there are many, um, <laughs> but I've just picked the, the four that I've been, uh, been fielding questions on. So, um, you know, well, the first one really is, is we saw this come through from EPA, I think, last week or the week before. There's been a 20% increase in poison control calls related to disinfectant misuse. And I think this is just a watch out for everybody as we, as we all have increased our, you know, disinfection processes in our places of work, in the, the places where we care for our sick, but also in our, our own homes. So just, you know, being very aware of how to use a, a disinfectant safely, but also how to store a disinfectant safely. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot of like hand sanitizers in different bottles or in larger, um, larger containers. Um, we have to be just very careful about, you know, who can, you know, who can access those. And, and we think about our kids and we think about um, misuse and, um, and unfortunate events related to, to storing um, chemicals like this. So that's the first one, uh, just to watch out for us all. Um, and then kind of along that vein too is um, there's quite a bit of um, homemade or, or um, um, home chemistry labs going on right now. So any kind of homemade disinfectants just are very worrisome because um, mixing chemicals is, is, is never a, a very good idea unless you're trained to do that and you understand the reactions that you may be creating. Um, but, you know, as a watch out to the, to the healthcare industry is, you know, making up or mixing chemicals or making a concoction using some sort of recipe that you found um, is just very ill-advised. You know, you're, you're now not using an EPA registered disinfectant that is backed up by science and data. You're, you're using something that you may not be able to verify the concentration. You may not know what the concentration of the starting materials are. Um, it's it's just it's ill advised to start making um, making your own disinfectants. Then the the next one is the, these um, claims that we're seeing a lot of right now, and I think we're seeing a lot of these things sold into the healthcare industry, and it, it is a little bit concerning. We're seeing um, these 90 day surface protection from COVID 19. So you know there are coatings and other products out there that are used mainly, it, it's, it's known as treated article treatments, um, where the, the coating or, the, or the, um, the active ingredient that's in, included um, into this coating or chemistry is really there to protect the surface from decay. So like you would use a wood preservative or a wood treatment so that you make sure that you're not, that the wood does not rot or um, something in a, a fabric so that the fabric doesn't go moldy. Um, but what we're seeing is just kind of a like um, some misleading claims being made by a number of companies to say that this 90-day surface protection is actually protecting you against COVID-19. Um, and again, there's there's unlikely to be data behind those, and it's unlikely that those kinds of surface protections can get a disinfectant-like kill. Um, by just putting it on your surface. Um, this is, you know, an area that's of, of great interest to people, um, but I think we just need to be very wary of some of the claims that are out there. Um, then uh, the other one that we're seeing more internationally than here, and actually when, when we started seeing it pop up, we did contact the CDC to kind of alert them that this may be 
Uh, we may be seeing this in the U.S. too, but um, some companies have been selling disinfection tunnels or booths. So the idea is that they have an inflatable tunnel or a, or a kind of a, a booth set up where there are spray balls or, or spray nozzles um, at various points, and they've actually they actually ask people to walk through um, through these tunnels so that they can be disinfected. These are people just walking through in their normal clothes with no PPE. Um, there was one incident where I, I was on a an email chain where um, a hospital in Mexico set this up so that they could get their staff to walk through before they went into the hospital. This is very concerning for human health. Um, uh, somebody made a call, I presume it was a healthcare professional, and by the afternoon it was taken down because the government said, absolutely no, we will not allow this kind of, um, this kind of misuse of chemicals um, and, uh, you know, very concerning to, to human health. So, you know, my, my point here on this slide is, you know, uh, obviously there's some worrisome, you know, uses, but also, you know, really question any of the too good to be true claims and use your resources to help you with that. That's great. Thank you. I mean, everybody is just very concerned right now and trying to be super proactive. And sometimes when they're proactive, they uh, take things to a place where they shouldn't be. And so I think it's important to kind of bring people back to reality. And everything really all roads seem to lead back to the label for the disinfectant or the product that you're using and just to always use the products the way that they're intended. So with that, we'll just do a little conclusion and then we'll answer a few questions, Elaine. So if you would like to summarize what we've talked about, that'd be great. Sounds good. So yeah, I think as you said, all roads lead back to the label and, and for COVID, I feel like all roads lead back to list N. Um, so, you know, the, they have they have created List N. I think they've been very good in trying to anticipate what we what we need as a as you know as the public. Um, and but they actually we've we've heard from the EPA that they're very interested to know how you, the end user, are dealing with this list N and what else you'd like to see or what information is important to you. Um, but always go back to the label for application instructions, contact time and concentration. You know, not everything is on list N. For example, um we had a question coming in about you know, is the concentration on list N, and, and it's not. So you really use the label um, to find your concentration. I think it's obviously very easy for wipes and, and ready to use, um, but for dilutables, you need to be very familiar with the label. Remember that the product may have multiple uses or instructions, so go and find the one that fits your use um, and make sure that you, you read through and you understand that. Um, when we think about application of disinfectants, so these hot topics of fogging and misting, you know, they're very, they can be very effective at disinfecting large areas in a short space of time. So they're very appealing. But just remember that not all applications are suitable for healthcare uses. And there, there is a lot of prep and investigation and research you need to do to pick those applications. PPE requirements and the safety of applicator, bystanders, patients must always be considered. And remember, especially for these, you know, um, electrostatic spray or misting fogging, remember that contact time must still be met for these uses, no matter what the application is. You need to make sure that the chemistry has time to get to the surface, time to act on those viruses. Um, for antimicrobial or pesticidal devices, you know, they're, as, as we see, they're not reviewed by the EPA. Um, they do have to have data to back up um, their claims because otherwise they're making false and misleading claims and you can absolutely take them to court if you feel that way. Um, um, and it's best to use to use these treatments as adjunct treatments or an add-on to your already established disinfection procedures. Um, and again, it's just a note, be aware of the too good to be true claims, use your resources to dig deeper, um, use, your, use your chemical um, providers like us, Ecolab, or, um, you know, you can go to the EPA. They've, they, they field questions every day from, um, you know, um, from the public on, on claims and, and false and misleading claims, but also use your other resources like, um, you know, AAG and, and APIC and SHEA. So there's other, other folks to go to that, that have knowledge on these things. That's great. That's a great summary of what we've gone through and hopefully everything that we've talked about has been really helpful to people. So now we're gonna go to a few questions that have come in and I'll take the first one and then, um, you can be kind of thinking about the other questions that you want to answer, Elaine, too, and then I'll, I'll read you some additional questions. Um, the first question is, are there any new recommendations for cleaning the operating room? 
And um, I looked at AORN and I looked at the CDC so that I could be sure I was up to date on this. And uh, according to AORN, the current CDC guidance is what you should follow. And it says that routine cleaning and disinfectant procedures using an EPA registered hospital grade disinfectant from list N are appropriate for SARS-CoV-2 in health care settings. So after the patient leaves the room after the surgical procedure, the entry should be delayed until enough time has elapsed um, for enough air exchanges to remove any air aerosolized infectious particles. And then the CDC also, I would point out, has a, a table on their website that lists how much time is needed based on the number of air exchanges you have in your operating room. And so if you wanna be sure to know how long you need to wait, you could look that table up. Uh, and then also the AORN guideline for environmental cleaning talks about the recommended cleaning procedures that should be done and the monitoring that should be done for quality and for consistency of cleaning. And it's really important to monitor for quality and consistency. And then the last thing I'll say is that we do get a lot of questions about linen and medical waste as well. And really, there's no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by linen or medical waste or has been transmitted that way. And so you really just follow your routine established practices outlined by your local, state, and federal regulations. Um, so that's the one question that I wanted to be sure to answer. And then uh, I think a second one that we had is, um, Elaine, what if I can't find the EPA product number on the EPA registry? Sure. Um, so if you if, if you found the, the EPA number on your label and you've typed it into the list to list ends search bucket, and it doesn't come up, then it ha you know it hasn't got the approval for SARS-CoV-2. Now. There are incidents where, um, and these are becoming less and less, but there are incidents where the product has the, the necessary claims on the label, like the human coronavirus um, or the emerging viral pathogen claim, and they didn't get on the list, um, and they may be in process, but, but this list is updated every week. And so um, either it will appear in a week's time, or you know you go to your chemical provider to ask them if, if they're in process of getting their claims fast-tracked. Um, but if it's not on it, it's, it's, it's really not, it's, you know, you should really look for a product that is on the list. Okay, good. Um, here's another question. After I have wetted the make your own wipes canister, uh, how long can I use that product for? Okay. And I think this is really dependent on chemistry type. Um, so, you know, it, it should be. Um, it's, it's related to the, to how long that use concentration is good for. Um, so, you know, for oxidizers, it's quite short. I think, Linda, it's probably 24 hours. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Most, most oxidizing chemistries, once you've mixed them into the use dilution, um, their shelf life is 24 hours. Um, so, you okay. know, the, a good, again, a good rule of, thumb, rule of thumb is to go to your chemical provider just to make sure that you're, you're doing things the right way. Excellent. So the next question is, is there a national source for manufacturer's instructions for cleaning and disinfection? Yes. So, you know, when I thought about this question first, I, I thought, oh, I don't think so. But actually, the master labels can all be looked up on the EPA website. And we actually have a link at the end of this presentation. Um, so the master labels are, you know, they're, they're publicly available and, and the EPA has um, a web page called PPLS and you can just simply look, you can look by product name, um, the registration number, even the company, you can type in the company and pull up all their products. So yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a nice, again, a nice um, search, search function. And most of those um, labels are very long. Um, some of them are, are extremely long, like could be 40 pages long. But they, most of them are searchable to, you know, like they have PDF searchable functionality. So you can, you know, quickly look up disinfection or quickly look up fogging, for example, and find that part of the label. Okay. Um, were there any other questions, Elaine, that you thought of that, or that you saw that you were interested in, in answering? If not, I might have one more. Yeah, I saw one um, related to the food contact sanitizing. So uh, somebody asked a question about um, what, uh, what are the FDA approved sanitizers that are available? So it's, it's sometimes a little bit, um, it's kind of a little counterintuitive, but um, even though the FDA really makes the rules for food in this country, um, the only thing they don't make the rules about are 
the sanitizers that we use to clean the areas that we prep the food or make the food. That is within EPA's jurisdiction. Um, so, so you won't see an, an, an FDA-approved um, food contact sanitizer, um, but the FDA will always reference that you need to use an EPA-registered uh, food contact sanitizer. Um, and then the other question, follow-on question was, what products are um, regulated by the FDA? And in this, you know, COVID space, um, hand sanitizers and hand care products, um, those are regulated by the FDA. Excellent, thank you. So those were most of the good questions that we had. Um, here are some links to the information that we discussed today. Uh, and so, and then I think we added a link to the guidance that just came out about um, cleaning and disinfecting public spaces, workplaces, businesses, schools, and homes, which might be interesting to some of the people that are on the call today as well. I'd like to extend a very special thank you to Dr. Black for presenting the latest information on regulatory landscape for disinfectants and disinfectant technology as it relates to COVID-19. Um, Elaine, you're always so easy to talk to and you have such a depth of knowledge, it's fantastic. So this concludes our program today. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and sent to you along with the downloadable FAQ document. And if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to your Ecolab account executive. Thanks everyone for joining the call today.